All right, we are continuing our study in the book of First Peter, but before we do that, I kind of just wanted to share with you something that um, God kind of spoke to my heart, and I, it blessed me so much, and I hope it does to you guys too. It's kind of a continuation from the women's retreat. Um, so for those of you who were or were not there, um, on Sunday, we studied the scripture that says, Be still and know that I am God. Such a powerful scripture and we taught the whole chapter and talked about what that meant um but i don't know how many of you have struggled since the retreat being still and knowing that i am god <laughs> and resting in that peace right our theme was peace be still right and that's what so i'm laying there and for me this is crazy town season for me i it's just nuts like i'm blah, everywhere so when i lay down in bed at night that's when my brain turns on right and tells me all the things that i need to be doing worrying about thinking about blah, 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 and all the stuff that has to get done before tomorrow and all of these things. So anyways, I'm laying there one night and I'm just can feel myself just being so nervous, you know, and just like anxious and all this kind of stuff. And the scripture comes to my mind and I just begin to say, be still and know that I am God. But not just that. I started basically highlighting each word in the sentence. So God just kind of led me to, speak, to say, be still and know that I am God. So just be here with me. And then I was like, be still. So calm your heart, be still, and know that I am God. Be still and know. Know, not feel, not think, know that I am God. Be still and know that I, not you, Lydia, I am God. Be still and know that I am I am everything that you need at all times. Be still and know that I am God. I am the creator of the heavens and the earth, and I got this. And as I just began to do that over and over in my mind, just highlight every word and stop and really think about what it all meant, it was amazing the peace that flooded my heart in that moment when I was prior filled with anxiety. And so I just wanna share that with you guys um, to encourage you, but also to kind of give you a tool to take that very easy phrase, be still and know that I am God. It means so much when you break it down word by word like that um, and just practicing this in our lives, practicing the peace right, that we have in Jesus. So anyways, that was not the message. That was a little message before the message. So I'm taking after my husband. You know, I'm doing a sermon before the sermon. <laughs> um, but we really are going to be starting, uh, fin not finishing, we're going to be continuing our study in First Peter. Um, so we spent three weeks in chapter one. If you weren't here, I encourage you to, to go back on Facebook if you'd like to catch up and listen to those teachings. But um, where we're at, I kind of do want to do a little bit of recap because we have been a couple of weeks um, out of First Peter. Um, so if you remember, First Peter is written by Peter, obviously the apostle, um, and it's written during a very dark time for Christian believers. They were facing immense persecution. There was a wicked government in place. Caesar Nero was the emperor of Rome at the time, and it was just very hard times for believers. And so this is kind of the, the setting that he's writing this letter to. And if you remember some of the things we highlighted in chapter one, um, he reminds the believers that they have been redeemed by God's abundant mercy, right? Not getting what we deserve. And that because of his abundant mercy, we now have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus died and rose again because of the resurrection, you and I have a hope that is alive, right? That no matter what is happening in our lives, we always have a living hope in Jesus Christ because of the resurrection. And then he reminds them of their inheritance. He says, you have an inheritance awaiting you in heaven that is incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven for you that does not fade away. So ladies, we have got to be eternally minded, right? And he's telling these believers, listen, this is not your home. He starts the letter by telling him that we are sojourners passing through on our way to our eternal home where the Lord has an eternal reward that is undefiled, uncorruptible, waiting just for you. And then he reminds them because he knows that they are facing persecution and hard times in their lives of believers, that they are kept, which means they are guarded by the power of God through faith right? So God's job is to keep them. Their job is to have faith in him. And he says, even though you're facing these various trials, 
that testing that you're going through right now of all these various trials, he said, it's testing your faith, but your faith, if you continue to put your faith in Jesus will come out the other side of that trial refined as it were by fire, right? What happens to silver and gold when they go through a fire, they become more precious. And that's what he says, though your faith may be tested, you know, though it's being tried by fire, it will become more precious to you. And then he goes on and he, he reminds them that they are redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb of God and what it costs Jesus to redeem them, to buy us back. And then he ends that by saying, in light of that fact that you have been bought back at a very high price with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, love one another, right? He reminds them of what Jesus told them. He reminds us what the Old Testament tells us, that the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment, right? That's what he said. He said, all men will know you're my disciples. How? By your love, one for another. I just want to kind of back up a little bit into chapter one and kind of read chapter one because Peter is definitely continuing the same thought he ended chapter one with as he moves into chapter two. So I kind of want to remind us what he says. Um, so in chapter one, beginning in verse 23, it says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower fades away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. And so he ends the last chapter by telling you, love one another. And he talks about the importance of God's word, that heaven and earth are going to pass away, but his word will never pass away. So talking about the importance of the word. And then it says in verse number one of chapter two, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And so he's continuing that thought, talking about the word of God, as he says here in verse number one, therefore, therefore, keeping in mind everything Christ has done for you, therefore, keeping in mind um, how much the Lord has redeemed us from, he says, lay aside, right? Lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. This definitely ties in to loving one another. Everything that he mentions there is a relational sin, okay? It's, it's basically has to do with our relationship with one another. When he says there, lay aside, it's like take off a garment is basically what that word lay aside there means. Um, so these are things in our lives that he wants us to take off that should not be a part of our life in Christ. They're not loving. They're exactly opposite of what he's called us to do, which is love one another. The first thing he mentions there is malice. That is ill will or an intention to do evil. Um, and then deceit. We all kind of know what deceit is, right? It's deceiving people. It's lying to people, not being honest. You know, the reality of it is that, you know, we are guilty of this many times, right? Uh, it's just a little white lie, right? That's not how the Lord sees it. He sees it as deception, right? And it's not to be a part, especially when we're dealing with one another. We want to be honest um, in our dealings with each other and with people in general. Um, the, the next thing he mentions there is hypocrisy. We all kind of have an idea of what hypocrisy means, but the literal meaning is to be a play actor. So it basically means to wear a mask. So when you come to church, you're this person, you put on your mask, you're happy face Christian, and you're just, you know, all of these things. And everyone thinks you're all these things because you're a really good play actor. But really, at life, at home, in real life, you take off the mask, right? And you have a whole lot of other characteristics that begin to kind of show themselves. The Lord says, don't do that be genuine, be who you are. Um, we are all flawed human beings, right? None of us is perfect. None of us has this down, right? The Bible says that we are works in progress and we'll be finished the day we see Jesus. And this whole entire life is him continually refining us and making us more like him. And we're not there yet. So when it comes to how you act with other people, just be real be genuine be who you are you do not have to be fake to come here you do not have to put on a mask and hide who you really are because ultimately that's deception right it kind of goes back to that 
Um, be genuine. And then the, the next thing it says is envy. Envy is jealousy. We are all guilty of this. And, and every last one of us, when was the last time someone got a brand new car or went on a really cool vacation and in your heart, you're like, that's so good for them. I'm so happy for them. And your first response was not like, must be nice right? Like that tends to be our first response. Like it must be nice to be able to afford a vacation like that. Must be nice to drive that car. Must be nice to wear those clothes or whatever the case may be. Um, we can be envious of people's children. We can be, oh, how come my two-year-old doesn't act like that? How come mine's throwing himself on the floor, you know, or, or you can be envious of somebody else's husband, right? Oh, if my husband was just as holy as their husband, you don't know that. <laughs> don't trip on that either. So, so envy, being jealous of one another. It's not, it's not kind. It's not polite. If somebody gets a new car, celebrate with them. Be legitimate about it, right? Don't be envious of that. Say good for you. You know, congratulations. You wanted a great trip. Great. Um, you know, loving each other in that way. And for all of us, we all struggle with these things, but they are not loving. This list is things that are not loving to be doing to one another. And so as a part of your new life in Christ, the, here's Peter reminding us, these things should not be a part of the body of Christ. So if we're doing them, knock it off, right? Because it's the old sin nature. And it's that old filthy garment that we used to wear when we walked in the world. And here he's saying, that garment does not belong in my house, right? It does not belong in your new life in Christ. So take off the filthy, filthy garments of being, uh, you know, catty with each other and all the things that we can kind of sometimes do and put on love. It goes on, it says in verse number two, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So desire the pure milk of the word. Why? That you may grow. So how do you and I grow in our relationship with Jesus? It tells you right here, the pure milk of the word. Okay, don't, don't skip that word pure, right? So the pure milk of God's word. If you want to grow in your knowledge of the Lord, if you want to become more like Jesus, if you would like to be more loving in your life, how do you grow in these areas? You study God's word. You be in God's word. You be washed by the water of the word on a daily basis. The word of God is living, powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword. It divides to the very joints and the marrow, right? It discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart right? It's the word of God that transforms us to become more and more like Jesus. And he says, if you want to grow, desire the pure milk of the word. And that word desire there is to crave. It is to vigorously, passionately have an intense desire. Does that describe how you feel about opening God's word every day? <laughs> that you just crave, you can't wait to open God's word. You have this incredible desire and passion to get in God's word because that's the word Peter uses here. If you want to grow, then desire God's word. It's interesting when the Bible talks about God's word, the words that it uses to describe God's word. So the words that it used to describe here, it's milk. In another place, it's meat. It's described as honey and it's described as bread. Okay, all those things satisfy, right? It's like you read, you look at bread, man. If you're hungry, like you eat a, you eat some bread. That to me is satisfying. I, I, I think I could live on bread alone, but, <laughs> but meat is satisfying, right? My daughter thinks that milk is very satisfying. She still wants to drink milk every day when she wakes up and every night before she goes to bed. Milk is what she desires. Honey, you read that story of Jonathan in the Bible, right? When he was starting to get real worn down and tired. It says that he ate a little honey and it lightened his face and it gave him energy to continue the battle. So you look at these different words that are used to describe God's word and they're all very satisfying words, things that would fulfill your hunger. God's word is not cotton candy and it is not junk food, okay? So it is something that satisfies. You are what you eat. You ever heard that? <laughs> That's the truth. You are what you eat spiritually. It is the exact same thing. Just as you need food every day to live, so you also need a daily dose of God's word, right? You need to be feeding, desiring the pure milk of the word if you want to grow. 
So here's the truth. Like this is, my husband is famous for this. You make a big dinner, you know, and your husband comes home from work and he eats an entire bag of chips when he gets home. Like how hungry is he going to be for your dinner that you made? No matter how good it is, right? He has fulfilled that desire with a junk food bag of chips, right? So he's not super craving what you had to eat. So he may eat a few bites to be nice. And so you don't get too mad. But the truth is he has no desire to eat what you made, even if he loves it, because he ruined his appetite with the bag of chips which is junk food, right? It does not provide any sustenance for him. Um, but the truth is in our spiritual lives, um, we can fill up on junk food and lose our desire for the pure milk of the word. The reality of it is that a lot of people try to fill up their spiritual life with cotton candy, okay? With spiritual experiences. It's all about how they feel and it's going from one spiritual high to the other. The truth is that is emptiness. Those people who live for spiritual experiences alone and they are not students of God's word are very immature believers in Jesus Christ. No matter how long they've been a Christian, if they're filling their spiritual diet with spiritual experiences rather than the word of God, I'm not knocking spiritual experiences. I've had really amazing spiritual experiences that have, have, you know, like increased my faith who had that have encouraged my heart. But the truth is my diet is of the word of God, right? Not chasing spiritual experiences. You also see, you know, junk food, right? Junk in, junk out. If we fill our lives with a whole bunch of junk food, sin, things like that, that, that can basically, it's like eating a bag of chips, you know, where we spend all of our time uh, listening to junk music, reading junk books, watching junk TV. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things, but I'm just saying, if that's what I'm feeding myself all the time and I have no desire for God's word, I need to take a look at what am I eating spiritually? What, it, what am I taking in to my life on a daily basis? Because if getting in the Bible in the morning is a drag for me, chances are I am filling my life with too much junk food or too much cotton candy. You know, because the truth is that, you know what, is it a battle to get in God's word every day? Absolutely it is. Are things going to distract you? Is your phone going to ring? Your kids are going to cry? Whatever. Yes, it is a struggle. But I'll tell you what, I can honestly say my time in the morning I have grown. I used to struggle with my devotional life so bad as a young pastor's wife. And every retreat that I'd go to, they talk about your devotional life. And I would just feel guilty every time. Like, I don't have a good devotional life. This, this is the problem, you know? Um, but the truth is when I made it a habit in my life every single day that I just told myself, whether it's a chapter, a verse, whatever it may be, um, that I am going to get in God's word every single day, no matter what it meant. And I had little, little kids at the time, and it was hard, but it got to the point where I determined it in my heart, I'm doing this. My kids got used to it, right? It used to be if my kids would then, at first it was like, mommy, 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 I need breakfast, I need this, I need that. And I was like, nope, this is mommy's Bible time. Go, go play for a little bit. Mommy will be done in 15, 20 minutes, you know? But it got to the point where they'd walk in my room, they'd see me read my Bible, and they would just turn around and walk back out. Because they knew, like, that's what that means. But even as teenagers, right, it doesn't get any less crazy when you have teenagers. They're, I think you'd run to everywhere and, you know, it's crazy and all this kind of stuff. So there's always going to be something in your life trying to distract you from the word. But I can honestly say in the mornings when I get up and I go get my coffee and I sit in my chair and I pull out my one-year Bible, it is me time. That, that is my time to just be quiet with the Lord and just get in the word. And I really do love that time in the morning. And so I want to encourage you, if it's a struggle for you right now, keep pressing in, keep drinking the milk, right? Keep, keep doing those things because you will develop an appetite for God's word, right? The more good habits you get in, it's kind of like people who live these very strict lives that work out all the time and they don't eat junk food. And you're like, how do you do that? It's become a habit in their life, right? They, they were disciplined and they, they set themselves a goal and they weren't going to eat junk food and whatever. And then pretty soon they don't even miss it, right? Pretty soon they don't miss all the junk food because they're just in a habit of living like that. But our spiritual life is much the same way. It's about habits that we form in our lives. And here he's saying, listen, if you want to grow in your relationship with the Lord, you want to grow in your love for fellow believers, you want to grow. The answer is very simple. It is desire the pure milk of God's word. And when you're feeding on a regular basis, God's word, you will grow. 
and you're not going to get all wonky and sideways and develop all these weird theological ideas that people who live on cotton candy and junk food develop, okay? So feed on the word. Feed yourself every day God's word because that's how we grow. And it goes on, it says in verse number three, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So why should you do these things? If you have tasted that the Lord has been gracious. It literally should be better translated since. Since you have tasted that the Lord has been gracious, you should put these things out of your life, right? All those unloving things he already mentioned. And you should be desiring the pure milk of the word because God is so gracious. And when you really think about it, really, when we start to become um, very critical, um, kind of having some ugly behaviors, being very unlovely, uh, the truth is it's oftentimes because I have forgotten the graciousness of God to me, right? Because maybe I'm a little bit further away from living in the world, you know? It's been a long time since I've done X, Y, or Z, and so I can look at someone else and I become very critical, um, very judgmental. But the truth is, here he's saying, listen, remember how gracious God has been to you, that God saved you from all of your sins, that though your sins were as scarlet, he has made you white as snow, not because you earned it, not because you, you uh, deserved it, but because of God's amazing grace in our lives. And so remembering God's graciousness, you know, is such a key to, to putting off some of these ugly behaviors, to putting on love, is remembering how God extended his grace to you. Are you grateful that God did that? Right? And he's saying, listen, deal with other people the same way. Just as God's been gracious to you, be gracious to other people, which is so hard. I'm not saying I have this down, but I'm saying when I start to fail in this area, chances are I've probably forgotten how gracious God was to me and is to me on a regular basis. Um, and so as we go on in verse number four, it says, coming to him, it's capitalized, so it's Jesus, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. God is building a spiritual house, okay, is what he's talking about here. Not a, a temple or a physical building, but he's building a house and he uses people. And that's what he's telling us here. You are living stones is what he calls the children of God, the followers of Jesus Christ. And I love that he says living stones and not cement blocks. Okay. <laughs> so cement blocks, if you've ever seen them, they're all exactly the same shape. They're all exactly the same size. It is not hard to build a building with cement blocks because it, they all fit together, right? Because they are all exactly the same size and the same shape. Are we cement blocks? Do we all look the same? Do we all have the same gifts and talents? Absolutely not, right? So he calls us living stones. Because if you've ever looked at a stone wall, right? It actually is a work of art to build a stone wall. Why? Because every stone is shaped a little bit differently, right? A craftsman actually has to do a lot of work to fit each stone in its right place to make the wall or the building. And so it is no accident that God calls us living stones because he is the architect. He is fitting us all into a building. See, we are the church. The building is not the church, okay? The people are the church. And the church is made up of living stones, each one very different. And so as we look at this, just as unique as your fingerprint is, as unique as your DNA is, right? God gave us each one of those individually. That's just for you. Um, so too, he has a place just for you in the building of God, in the church body. And he's fitting us all together in our own unique places with our own unique gifts and talents. And so as he's doing that, you know, it's interesting that he's using this kind of analogy, talking about um, being a living stone, being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Now, when the Jews who he's writing to would be thinking about a spiritual house, what would they be thinking of? The temple, right? It was still standing at this time. And when they think of a priesthood, a holy priesthood, what would they be thinking of? 
the Aaronic priesthood, right? Who, who did the sacrifices and things like that. The, the Levites, right? That's who they would have been thinking about. But little did they know, but obviously the Lord knew in 70 AD, the temple would be completely destroyed. It is still destroyed today. There is no temple in Jerusalem, right? There is no priests that do sacrifices. They literally cannot follow the Old Testament religious system of law, right? Because they don't have a temple. They don't have a priesthood anymore. It is no longer. But it was only going to be, this is written in like 63 AD. So it was going to be only a number of years after this is written that the temple would be completely destroyed. And what they would think of as a building and what they would think of as a priesthood would be completely gone. Why? Because when Jesus died and rose again, he changed everything, right? There would be no need anymore for a temple. There would be no need anymore for animal sacrifices. Because the truth is, the Lamb of God was always the plan, right? Those animal sacrifices were a picture of what God was going to do when he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. That's why when Jesus died on the cross, right, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That veil separated God from the people, right? Only the high priest could go in there once a year until that time. And then God busted that temple veil wide open showing now everyone has access directly into the presence of God. And so here is Peter telling them, listen, now that we live in the new covenant, now that Jesus has died and rose again, the church is the people and you are all a holy priesthood right? Not just a few. And we have all been commissioned to the ministry. Every last one of us. Jesus, one of the very last things he told his disciples was exactly that, right? I'll read it to you in Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew 28, beginning in verse number 19, it says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is called the Great Commission, right? And it has never been rescinded. That was God's intention, that now there was not a priesthood, that we were all in the ministry. We were all a part of the priesthood. All of our jobs is to be sharing the truth of Jesus Christ. And yes, we are all living stones, all built a little bit differently, right? We all have our own gifts. We all have our own talents. We all have, does that mean that every one of you should go quit your jobs today and, and go preach, you know, uh, on the streets for the rest of your life? No, right? He didn't call every one of us to be preachers, but he did call every one of us to be ministers, okay? To be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we look at this, you know, maybe you're a banker or an accountant or a teacher or you're the PTA president. Whatever you are, you are also a minister, right? You are in your mission field ministering the gospel in a very practical way because you guys are all planted in specific places for a specific reason. We can't all be in the same place, right? But all of us together, wherever God has planted us, if we see our lives goal is to be a minister for Jesus, no matter where it is that he has placed us, then the reality is we are in the ministry. Even if we work at Grand Canyon University or you work at the elementary school or you work at a bank or whatever it is that you are in ministry. This is one of the things that, um, and, 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 and you know, we were called to that in Acts chapter one, right? In Acts chapter one, when the Holy Spirit is given, what, what does he say? You'll receive power to be my witnesses, right? to Judea, Samaria, to the very ends of the earth. And he doesn't just say, okay, your job as believers, as the building of God is to be a holy priesthood who's out there ministering to people. He doesn't just say, okay, now figure out how to do it. It says that he gives us a helper, right? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what helps us to be good ministers for the, the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that fills me, that lives inside of me, that enables me to be his witness wherever he has planted me. Um, it was one of the things I love the most about this year. Um, I do work for Grand Canyon University. Most of you guys know that. But I went down and, and our president, um, his name is Brian Mueller, and he is an amazing Christian man. Um, he, he is a pastor. He's absolutely phenomenal. But he gave the, all the, the uh, staff a big talk. Um, and basically what he was saying was exactly this idea. He said, listen, we are raising up pastors and we are raising up worship leaders, but that is not all that we're doing. 
we as a university have got to see that we need to be raising up Christian doctors and nurses and lawyers and engineers and all these people because we need the gospel in every area, in every corner of the world. And so if we can educate them and raise them up in Jesus Christ, we are doing our job, right? But that's the same idea here, right? Whatever you do, understand you are a minister. You are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, regardless of what it is God has called you to vocationally. Our ultimate goal, right, is to bring people to know Jesus Christ. And we have our unique area of influence in that. And then he says in here, he says, you as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we do not have to offer animal sacrifices anymore, but we are called to offer up spiritual sacrifices, right? So what are spiritual sacrifices? I'll give you a couple examples. Um, one, it tells us in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse number one says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So what is something that we can offer to God that is our reasonable service assessor? Yourself, right? It's you. Offer yourself to the Lord as a living sacrifice. I love that song that Keaton did, you know, basically just saying, hey, take everything I am. You know, like I lay everything down and I want all that you have for me. You know, that's such an awesome way of actually like putting into words what we're talking about here, where we literally are laying our life down before the Lord every single day and saying, I am yours. Do with me what you want today. Bring those people into my life, those conversations into my life. Whatever it is you're calling me to do, here's my life. Take it and do what you want with it. That That is being a living sacrifice, right, to the Lord. Problem with living sacrifices is we oftentimes want to wriggle off the, the altar, right? <laughs> we, we lay our lives down and we're like, Lord, just do whatever. And you start to do something, you're like, just kidding. I'm going to take this right back, you know. I had my own plans. I had my own agenda for today. Um, and I'm not really feeling that, right? So to be continuing to offer our lives every day as a living sacrifice. Another way that we can sacrifice to the Lord is in giving, right? In Philippians chapter 4, Paul talks about that. You know, that, that when we give to the Lord, it is a sacrifice, right? It is. When you give to the Lord out of what you have, um, a portion of what you have, that is a sacrifice that you're making that furthers the kingdom of God. Another example he gives us is in Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews 13, beginning in verse number 15, It says, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So another sacrifice that you and I can give to the Lord that's acceptable to him is our praise. Is it ever a sacrifice to give praise? It is, right? Sometimes you don't feel like it. Sometimes you don't feel like being thankful for today. (laughs) You know, you don't feel like being thankful for them kids (laughs) or whatever. (laughs) But the truth is, you know what? As we choose to praise the Lord, even when life is not good, right? Even when things are hard in our lives, but we offer a sacrifice of praise. Why does he ask you to do that? Because praise does something real powerful to you, to me. Right? It's for me, ultimately. I mean, it, it blesses the Lord's heart, obviously, you know, when his kids talk to him and praise him, right? But really, it gets my focus off of my problems and off of what's going on. And it reminds me of God's goodness and God's grace in my life and his presence in my life and all that he's done for me. And so, yes, some days do I have to fight to offer a sacrifice of praise? Sometimes. But is it, it is a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. And it's like sweet smelling aroma to him, right? That as we, as we send those praises up, it, it blesses our father's heart. So those are some of the ways that we can offer sacrifices acceptable to God. Because we are living stones and we all do have a place where we fit in this building of God, where he fit us perfectly together and we are called to offer sacrifices that are acceptable to him. It goes on and it says back in 1 Peter in verse number six, therefore it is also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, 
The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which also they were appointed. It's amazing how much of this chapter is Peter quoting the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Peter had a very good working knowledge of the word of God. And he is using that as he's teaching the people here. And he says here, Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but he was rejected, right? Yeah. And Jesus was rejected primarily by the, by the chief priest, by the rulers of the day, right? He was rejected by the religious system of the time. But it says here that he is the chief cornerstone. I was like, what is a chief cornerstone? I don't really know what that is. So I kind of started doing some research last night on what exactly is a chief cornerstone. Because Jesus, he's quoting, what Peter's quoting here is out of Psalm 118. It's repeated so many times in the Bible that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. But what is a chief cornerstone? So glad you asked. Um, a chief cornerstone, wherever the chief cornerstone is, all other stones are laid in relation to the chief cornerstone. It sets the direction of the building. It also ensures proper alignment of the rest of the building. And I got to thinking about that. I said, duh, no wonder he calls him the chief cornerstone. Here's the thing. If Jesus is not the chief cornerstone of your life, if he's not the chief cornerstone of this church, if he's not the chief cornerstone of your theology, guess what? Your whole building is wonky, right? It's not stable. It is not going to stand because he's the chief cornerstone and everything after that has to get in line with the chief cornerstone or the building is not secure. So if your life, the things that you believe, they don't line up with Jesus Christ, they're wrong, not him, right? He is that that thing he is the measuring line for our lives he's the measuring line for our church he is the way the truth and the life and no man comes to the father but by him right so if we are aligned with the chief cornerstone and our lives are lining up right in line with that chief cornerstone and our church is in line with that chief cornerstone guess what it's going to be a good building right it's going to be a building that doesn't have crooked walls going all over the place and so I thought that was such a cool picture that everything starts at the chief cornerstone and then has to get in line in order for the building to be a good building because it is spiritually true for us too. It keeps us from getting off in left field and coming up with wacky things. Um, and you see a lot of wacky things that people have come up with because Jesus is no longer the chief cornerstone, right? It's become a revelation or a this or a that, and it's no longer Jesus. And the next thing you know, the building is not sturdy and the building is going all wackadoo, okay? So we gotta keep Jesus as the, as the chief cornerstone and for, for our building to be stable and secure. Now, it just kind of reminded me of the story, which you've all heard it. I'm gonna read it to you again though. Um, in Matthew chapter seven. In Matthew chapter seven, Jesus is speaking in verse number 24 and he says this, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So we have got to build our lives on the cornerstone, the rock that is Jesus Christ, and his word right that's what he said if you build your life on my words it's a firm foundation and yes the rains are going to come the storms of life are going to come but your house is going to stand but if you build your house on anything other than jesus right shifting sand it's not a firm foundation and those same winds and those same storms are going to come but your house is going to fall and great will be its fall because it doesn't have the right foundation which is jesus christ and his word and so for us, it says here that he is the chief cornerstone and all who believe in him will by no means be put to shame. Amen. That's us. I want you to keep in mind too, this is Peter's commentary, obviously, right? He's writing this book. And so I want to kind of take you back because here he is saying Jesus is the foundation, right? Jesus is the rock. And so I want to kind of take you back um, to Matthew chapter 16. 
Whoops, I don't think I marked it, but you know I have enough in Matthew that I probably can find it pretty easy, sorry. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse number 13. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am? Or, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, who wrote the book of First Peter, answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Some people take that verse, and they make it say that Peter is the rock that Jesus is talking about. Is Peter the rock that Jesus is talking about? This rock I will build my church? No. Uh, no. Peter tells us right here. Oh, and by the way, I'm not the rock. Okay. I am not the rock upon whose, you know, the, the church is going to be built. It's clearly, he's saying Jesus is the rock, right? He is the chief cornerstone. What he's saying is that confession of faith that he made, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That was the rock upon which the church was going to be built and the gates of hell would never prevail against it. Amen? Amen. And it says here kind of at the end of this section, um, I love how he says to multiple times precious because Peter was a big fisherman. Was, uh, tradition tells us he was like a big, huge man. And yet here he is multiple times talking about how precious Jesus was to him. And I love that. Um, and it goes on. And, and in the end here, it says, um, he will become the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word. Here's the thing. Jesus is the rock on which we build our life, but he is a stumbling block to the world, right? Because the truth is, if you do not accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are walking in the dark, right? Because he is the light of the world. And when you reject the light of the world, it says when you're being disobedient to the light of the world, that means you are walking in darkness. Anybody ever tried to walk in darkness? Yeah. Is it very easy to walk around your house when all the lights are off? Yeah. No, I have bruises all over my legs. Like I am not good at it, right? I bump into the bed frame or the wall or whatever, because the truth is I'm not meant to walk in the dark, right? I need some light. But the world is walking in darkness. If they've rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are walking around stumbling, getting bruised and bumped and broken because they are walking in darkness instead of the light. And so for us, as we, as we look at this and as we kind of um, wrap up that section, you know, um, which is another reason why the Bible, right, has called us to be what? Right. Salt and light. We are to be light in this dark world. That when people look at you, they see the light of Jesus in you. And they see, how are you not bumped and bruised and walking into walls all over the place? And that's when you have the opportunity to say, well, let me tell you about Jesus, the light of the world. Because I was walking in darkness. I was bumping around and getting bruised up by the world. But I met a man who loved me so much that he died for me. And he extended his grace and mercy and forgave all of my sins. And he turned the lights on in my life. And now I don't walk in darkness and I'm not bumping into things and hurting myself all over the place because I know the chief cornerstone. I know the rock and my life's built on him. Amen. Amen. It goes on. It says in verse number nine, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It says, but you, so you're not walking in darkness, right? He's making a distinction between us and the world. He says, but you who are Christ, who have built your life on the rock are a chosen generation. I got to thinking about that. And I thought, you know, every generation kind of has, you know, had like a, um, what I, like a infamy. I don't know how else to say it, but you know, like, like the millennials, I'll just use them for, I mean, they get a lot of heat, right? Like, oh, millennials, blah, blah, blah. You know, they're a chosen generation. The baby boomers chosen generation, right? No matter when you were born, you are a chosen generation because God is moving and has always moved in every generation in human history, right? Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So no matter what generation you find yourself in, no, you are chosen. So you're not exempt because you know, you're a baby boomer and you're not exempt because you're a millennial or anywhere in between. We are all a chosen generation, no matter when that may be. 
He says, we're a holy nation and a royal priesthood. And it, this, this royal priesthood, the priesthood is not reserved for a select group of, uh, a small group of men, right? The royal priesthood, we've already talked about that. We are all ministers. And he says, his own special people. His own special people for what purpose though? At the very end of that, I want you to read that. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So why? I mean, only God could do this, right? Take a group of such eclectic people and put us all together and call us all into the ministry, right? Well, only he could do that. But as he's done that, he did it for a purpose. Your purpose, my purpose, every generation, right? We have all, there's nobody excluded from this, been called to do one thing. And that's this, proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That, ladies, is your job. It is your job to your kids. It is your job to your family. It is your job to your coworkers. It is your job while you live on this earth that you proclaim the goodness of God, that you proclaim the light that saved you from walking around in the dark is what it says, and that we live our lives wherever that may be in whatever vocation that that may be in, that we're proclaiming the God who saved us from dark and delivered us into his marvelous light. In Matthew 5, it says, Jesus is speaking here and it says in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Right? This is all of our life goals right here. Let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and they would glorify God in heaven. Right? And they would desire what you have, that light that you have, that they would want it. It goes on and it says in verse number 10, back in First Peter. Don't panic. I'm ending here. So if you guys are like, oh my gosh, she's only on verse 10. How long is she going to preach? Okay, I promise this is my last verse. But, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. He's saying here, we were not a people, right? We are all from different cultures, backgrounds, everything. We are not like a nationality, right? We, If we went around this room, I mean, we have a million different cultures, backgrounds, upbringings, all this kind of stuff. But yet God has made us a building, right? A building of God. Each one of us unique, all these living stones. He's fit us all in this place. Only he could take this very diverse group and make us a people, right? Together, the body of Christ. And that's what it's saying here. And now because he's brought us all together, there is neither Greek nor Jew, male nor female, right? Uh, slave nor free. The Bible tells us that multiple times that we're all just the people of God. And it says who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy, which is a beautiful thing that though we were once sinners, now we are saints, right? Because we've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so as we just kind of wrap up this little section here, or I just want us to really encourage all of us to, to really take this to heart that you are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are a living stone handpicked by God to fit perfectly somewhere in the body of God. And so whatever it is that he has gifted you to do or given you talents to do, use them proclaiming the goodness of God, right? Proclaiming the light that you have been delivered into, right? That though you walked in darkness once, now you walk in light. That we would really see our mission here on this light as we're sojourners passing through. Our job is to collect as many people with us as we go on to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. That we would take people there with us. And so when we take on that responsibility for ourselves, that it's not just Chris or it's not just me who's been called to be ministers of the gospel, it's every single one of us because you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, God's own special people that he redeemed, that he delivered from darkness into his marvelous light. He gave you his mercy and his grace. And now he's asking us to offer sacrifices acceptable to him, right? That we would offer our life back to him and say, Lord, I am a living sacrifice. I am yours. Do with me today, this year, this month, as you will. And Lord, every day, 
let your light so shine before men that people would see and they would glorify my Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for... Lord, just that we do grow by studying your word and it is so powerful and it is living and it's right where we need to be tonight. And so Lord, I do pray that as we've spent time in your word, that the result would be that we would grow. And Lord, that the more that we're in your word, the more we would desire to be in your word so we could learn more about you. Lord, so we could make sure that our life is in line with the chief cornerstone. Lord, that we're not getting off to the left or to the right, but Lord, we're, we're right where you want us to be. Lord, I pray for each one of these ladies, Lord, that you would fill her afresh with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that wherever you have planted her in whatever house that she lives in, whatever family you've given her, whatever job you've placed her in, Lord Jesus, that we truly would be those people who live our lives praising God. Lord, for the marvelous work that you did do in our lives. And Lord, that we would be a light to the world. Lord, but in order to be a light, Lord, we have to be reflecting you. We have to be walking with you. We have to, to be living a life, Lord, that, that does glorify you, a life of praise. And so, Lord, I do ask for each one of us that you would, um, Lord, help us to realize that we are in the ministry, every last one of us. Lord, and you've given us a job to do, and that's to share your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your light with a very dark, lost world. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this and just ask for there to be fruit in our lives, Lord, that you'd help us to bring people to come to know the grace and the forgiveness that's found only in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.